Hi, I'm Bo Carnes with FreeCodeCamp.org. In this course, I will be teaching you the basics of OpenStack and how to use it. OpenStack is an open source software that provides cloud infrastructure for virtual machines, bare metal, and containers. To follow along with this course, it can be helpful to have a basic understanding of the Linux command line, networking, and virtualization. But none of that is required. By the end of this course, you will have a core understanding of what OpenStack is, and you will know the basics of setting up and administering OpenStack using the OpenMetal platform. You'll also understand some commonly used OpenStack services. So let's talk more about what OpenStack actually is. OpenStack is an open source cloud computing platform that is used by organizations to manage and control large scale deployments of virtual machines, such as in a cloud computing or virtual private server environment. OpenStack is a popular choice for organizations because it's scalable, reliable, and provides a high degree of control over the underlying infrastructure. Besides being used to manage deployments of virtual machines, OpenStack can also be used to manage storage and networking resources in a cloud environment. In some ways, OpenStack can be compared to AWS, but here are some key differences between the two. OpenStack is an open source platform, while AWS is a proprietary platform. OpenStack offers more flexibility and customization options than AWS. OpenStack typically requires more technical expertise to set up and manage than AWS since you basically have to set up everything yourself. In the past, beginners had trouble getting into OpenStack due to its complexity and difficulty in being set up for smaller teams. But new technology has come out to make OpenStack available as a service which opens up the door to this super powerful open source cloud system. This video can be followed by beginner admins but infrastructure-focused people, like DevOps and system teams, should find this very valuable. Let's go into more detail about what OpenStack offers. Beyond standard infrastructure-as-a-service functionality, additional components provide orchestration, fault and service management, and other services to ensure high availability of user applications. OpenStack is broke up into services to allow you to plug and play components depending on your needs. This OpenStack map shows common services and how they all fit together. I'm not gonna cover every service here, but let me tell you what some of the more common OpenStack services do. OpenStack Object Storage, or SWIFT, is a highly scalable distributed object storage system. OpenStack Block Storage, called Cinder, is a service for managing block storage devices. OpenStack Compute, called Nova, is a cloud computing fabric controller which manages the allocation of compute resources. OpenStack Networking, called Neutron, is a system for managing networks and IP addresses. The OpenStack Dashboard, which is called Horizon, is a web-based interface for managing OpenStack resources. OpenStack Identity, called Keystone, is a system for managing user accounts and access control. OpenStack Image, called Glance, is a service for storing and retrieving virtual machine images. OpenStack Bare Metal, called Ironic, is a service for provisioning and managing bare metal servers. So those are some of the more common services, and we'll be demonstrating some of them later in this course. There are a bunch of different ways to deploy and configure OpenStack based on the needs of your application or organization. So we're about to learn how to get started with OpenStack and use many of the most common features. One of the easiest ways to get started with OpenStack is by using the OpenMetal on-demand private cloud. This allows us to quickly deploy OpenStack to the cloud and simplifies the setup process. OpenMetal provided a grant that made this course possible. While we'll be using Open Metal to learn about OpenStack, the material covered in, the, in this course applies to any OpenStack deployment, not just ones that use Open Metal. So no matter how you want to use OpenStack, this course is for you. And feel free to leave a comment with anything that you're learning or any questions you have about this content. So let's look at how to set up OpenStack on Open Metal. To get OpenStack set up, you need to provision and set up your cloud on Open Metal. We'll just follow the prompts on this OpenMetal central page to get everything set up. 
During the setup process, you're going to have to enter a public SSH key. Later, when we want to SSH into one of the cloud servers, the public-private key pair will basically act as our password or our login information to SSH into the server. So to get a public SSH key, there's a few different ways, but the most common way is to go over to your terminal or your command line. Now, this is going to work pretty similar whether you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux. There is a program called SSH Key Gen. So if you just type in SSH Key Gen, it will generate a public-private key pair. Now, you may have to install the SSH KeyGen program on your computer, but also it may already be automatically installed. So I'm not going to go through the whole um, generation prompts because I've already generated it. So once you've generated it, you're going to have to get access to the private key that you generated. So I'm just going to cd into the change directory into the, my .ssh folder. And again, this is the same on Windows or Mac or Linux. Now if I list everything in here, we can see all the, the keys. Now I've already renamed my private key to have the extension .pem. Yours may not have that extension, but it doesn't matter whether what the extension is. And right now we're trying to get the public key anyways. So we're going to just have to open up this file with the public key. Now, depending on your system, you may be able to use Vim or some other text editor to open up this public key. I'm just going to use Vim on my system and open up the public key. And then I can copy this public key. If I go back over to my web browser, I'll just paste it in to load it up. And then I'll just finish setting everything up here. Open Metal Private Clouds are deployed with OpenStack to three bare metal servers. These three servers comprise the private cloud core. To OpenStack, these three servers are considered the control plane. Private clouds are deployed with Ceph, providing your cloud with shared storage. Ceph is an open source software defined storage solution. And we'll be going into more detail about Ceph later in this course. Now let's view the hardware assets that were created on OpenMetal. So if you just created a cloud, you may already be on the cloud management page. If not, if you're not on this cloud management page, you may be on this page and you just have to click Manage. Now let's click Assets on the left side menu. This page contains a list of assets included with your private cloud deployment. These include your hardware control plane nodes and IP blocks for inventory and also the provider IP address blocks. The private cloud can have different hardware based on the options you selected in your deployment. So if you're following along and you selected the same things as me, it should look pretty similar to this. So these up here, these, thing, these three here, these are three cloud core MB small V1 control plane nodes. And then the inventory IP address blocks and the provider IP address blocks. With these private clouds, OpenStack is deployed with three hyper-converged control plane nodes. Now let's see how to access these control plane, plane nodes. So these are the nodes, and you can access these control plane nodes directly through SSH as the root user. If we go back over to the MyCloud page, it gives you some instructions on how to access. So if we go to these this access things, you can see it gives you instructions. You can see it says 21721. Just I want to show you that that's the same IP address as the first one here, 21721. So when you're accessing your your cloud, you should generally access just the first one one of these cloud core smalls. So let's go back over here, and it's going to show us what we need to do to access our cloud. So we can access through the SSH key we provided during the private cloud deployment. So we're just going to use this command here. You will obviously have to change the key name and IP to match your information. But let me just copy this and I'm going to go over to my terminal. 
Okay, I'm in the terminal and you can see here is the SSH command. It's not the exact same as the one we just copied because I've updated it to have the file name of my SSH key. Now yours may not say .pem on the end. You may just be doing id slash rsa or underscore rsa. That's the most common way to do it. So this is basically the password to log in to our node. So I'm just going to hit enter here and insert the pass key. Okay, we are logged in here. So we're logged in as a root. Now if we go back to this page, we can see that the end goal isn't just to SSH into our node. We are actually trying to get into the OpenStack dashboard. Horizon is the name of the default OpenStack dashboard, which provides a web-based user interface to OpenStack services. It allows the users to it allows the user to manage the cloud through a graphical interface. So to access the new cloud's OpenStack dashboard, which is called Horizon, we'll need to uh, first obtain the Horizon's administrator password. The username by default is admin. And this is showing right here what we need to do to get the password to log in. So after we log into this node, which we have done on our terminal, I'm going to copy this command here. So basically this command is going to display our password on our command line. So let's go back over to our terminal. I'll just paste in that command there. And now we have the Keystone Admin password. So I'm just going to copy this password here. And then if you go here, it shows you that we're going to get the Keystone Admin password. Now that we have the password, we can launch Horizon. On Open Metal, you can click the Horizon tab on the left menu. So you can see down here, I'm going to click Horizon. It's opening into a new tab. And so I just opened to a new tab. Let me zoom in a little quick, a little bit here. And I'm going to use the username admin. And then I'm just going to paste in the password I just copied from the terminal. I'll click sign in. Okay, we're signed in to open to Horizon, and it's the OpenStack dashboard. Now this is going to look pretty similar no matter where you're hosting your OpenStack. So we're using Open Metal, but there's plenty of other ways to host OpenStack, and Everything on Horizon is going to be basically the same no matter where you're hosting. So the first thing we're going to learn to do is to create a project. In OpenStack, the cloud is divided through the use of projects. Projects have associated with them users who have differing levels of access, defined by roles. An administrator defines resource limits per project by modifying quotas. So let's learn how to create a project and associate a user with it. And we'll learn how to how project quotas can be adjusted. And like I said, the, this interface will be similar no matter where you deploy OpenStack. So there are three root level tabs. Let me close it so you can see. We have the project tab, the admin tab, and the identity tab. Only users with the with administrative privileges can see the admin tab. So some people may just see project and identity. So to create your first project, let's go to identity and then projects. So you'll see that several projects already exist, including the admin project. That's right here. So these projects are deployed by default and generally should not be modified. But we want to create a new project. So I'm just going to create or click the create new project button right here. And then we just have to fill in some information. I'm just going to call this deploy development and you can see it's already giving me a suggestion because I've tried this before so a description we'll just put development project and you can basically use any name or description that you want so you can also add project members or project groups but we're not going to cover that just yet right now I'm just going to create the project and finish creating the first project. So create new project development. And then you can see it right here. So once created, the project appears right in this page. Now while in this project listing page, you can view and adjust quotas for this project as the admin user. 
quotas are limits on resources, like the number of instances. So to view the quotas for this project, um, we're in the Identity Projects tab still. So now we are going to go to this drop down on the right. So we have the, our, our project we just developed. And then I'm going to click this drop down and go to Modify Quotas. And these are all the default quota values. So quotas also exist for the, the volume and the network. And if you set a value to negative one, that means the quota is unlimited. We're just going to use all the default values, but it's good to know where to go if you want to change these in the future. So I'll just click cancel. We're not going to save this. And now we're going to discuss how to create a user and associate that user with a project. So we have the project and we're going to associate a user. So there's already the default admin user, but now let's create a new user and log in with that user. So first we will go to identity uh, users, and this only works when you're logged in as admin or a user that has admin privileges. So I'm going to, um, well, well, first of all, you can see that there's several users that are already listed, and this is expected. These are created during the cloud deployment, and they generally should not be modified. So to create a new user, we'll just click Create User. And then we can just um, create, we'll just put in a username, password, primary, and then we'll just fill in all this information. So username, I'll put Bo. You can see description is uh, optional, and for username, I'll just put Bo at freecocamp.org. I'll put in my super secret password, and then I will select a project. So I'm just going to select development, the project that we just created. And then if we click the drop down on role, you can see there are several different options, and which obviously depend, you would choose different roles depending on the level of access required. The default OpenStack roles are this reader, member, and admin. So the reader is the, the least authoritative role in the hierarchy. And for this example, we will choose member, which is kind of like the, the middle, middle authority role. And then I'll just click Create User. Okay, next we're going to log out of Horizon. I'm going to click this drop down and go to Sign Out. And then I'm just going to log in with the new user, Bo. And then I'll put in the password and click Sign In. Okay, we're logged in with the new user. Upon logging back in, we're, the, we're by default in the newly created project. You can see the project we're currently on. You can see it says development. This is the project. There's only one available because we've only created one project. Now let's talk about managing and creating images. We'll learn how to upload an image. N not a graphical image, but an image as in a copy of a Linux installation. So we'll learn how to upload an image onto OpenStack as well as create images out of, an, uh, out of an existing instance. Images contain a bootable operating system that is used to create instances. You'll see that within Open Metal Cloud, there are several different images that are already available, including CentOS, Debian, Fedora, and Ubuntu. In addition to this, you have the option to upload images from other sources or create your own images. We'll learn how to upload images to Glance through Horizon and how to create an image from an instance snapshot. Glance is a tool for managing instances that allows users to discover, retrieve, and reg register virtual machine images and container images. Glance uses Ceph to store images instead of the local file system. To access images within your Horizon dashboard, we'll navigate to the Projects tab, which we're already on here, and then we'll go to Compute, and then we will go to Images. So this tab includes a list of all the images installed on OpenStack. The images you see have been preloaded by OpenMetal. Like I said, there's already some that you can install. Now these are these images aren't deployed or anything yet. They're just images you can use if you want. So let's see how to upload your own image. If we we can do that by clicking the create image button. When creating an image, you must choose the format of the image. 
So before we start filling this all out, we are going to need an image source. We're going to need a file here. So I'm going to, if you want to follow along, I'm going to leave a link in the description to a Sir OS image that you can use. I already have it downloaded, so I'll be able to select that file uh, when we're filling this out. So we're going to fill in the name Sir OS and then a description, a Sir OS image, and then I'm going to browse to find the image source. Okay, I'll select that. For the format, I'm going to choose this QCOW2 dash, I think it's Kimo, Kimo QEMU emulator. With our configuration, this is the recommended format. QCOW2 is the most common format for Linux KVM. It expands dynamic. QCOW2 is the most common format for Linux, for Linux KVM, and it expands dynamically and supports copy on write, which is all useful for what we're doing. So I'm going to select that, and then I will just keep all these uh, the default settings, and I'll cr click Create Image. Now it could take some time to complete uploading the image, but now we're done. We can actually use this image. So next we are going to create an instance in OpenStack Horizon. Instances, or virtual machines, play a, lar a large role in a cloud's workload. OpenStack provides a way to create and manage instances with its compute service called Nova. Nova is the OpenStack project that provides a way to provision compute instances, aka virtual machines. Nova supports creating virtual machines, bare metal servers, and has limited support for system containers. Nova runs as a set of daemons on top of existing Linux servers to provide that service. So let's see how to create an instance. And we're also going to create a private network and router, create a security group, and see how to add an SSH key pair. The first thing we'll do is learn how to create a private network and router. And then later we'll create an instance on this private network. So we're gonna to go to the project, and network, and networks. So we're just about to create a network, but later we're going to create a router. The router is created so the private network can be connected to your cloud's public network, allowing you to assign a floating IP address to it, making the instance accessible over the internet. But let's create a network by clicking the Create Network button. So you can basically call it anything you want. We're going to use the name Private. And then we can, we'll just uh, leave all of this uh, set to the default options and before and now we're going to go to the subnet tab here and here we are going to first we're going to create a name for our subnet and we'll just use private subnet and then the network address uh, we have to select the private network range so for this example I'll just do uh, 192.168.0.1 slash 24 and then we'll leave this as IPv4. And then the gateway IP is optional. If unset, a gateway IP is selected automatically. So we'll just keep it, we'll just have it set automatically. And we're not going to disable the gateway. And for the subnet details, uh, we'll just, we're not going to uh, change anything. We're just going to keep the default values here. Then I'll click create. And then once it's created, it will appear uh, on this list here. Okay, we next need to create a router to bridge the connections between the private network and the public network. The public network is already here. It's called external. So to create a router, let's go to the projects and network and then routers. And then you may be able to guess, we're just going to click create router. Okay, we'll set a name. I'm just going to call this router. And we'll leave most of this to the val default values. For selecting the network, we're going to choose the one we created, external. And then we're just going to click Create Router. Okay, next we're going to connect the router to the private network by attaching an interface. Performing this step allows network communication between the private and external networks. To attach an interface to the router, 
First we'll navigate to the list of routers and select the one previously created. So we're actually already on the list of routers. So I'm going to click the router. And then I'm going to go to the interfaces tab. And then I'm going to click add interface. Okay, for a subnet, we are going to choose the, the private subnet that we created. And if you don't set an IP address, one is selected automatically, which is what we want. So I will press submit to attach the private network to this router. The interface is then attached and now listed. Now I'm going to show you how we can visually see the network topology for the network for the cloud that we've created. So I'm going to go to project, network, and then network topology. So if I scroll down here, you can see this it indicates that the external network is connected to the private network through the router called router. And this is what we just created. So it's like a visual uh, representation of everything we've done so far. Now, security groups. Security groups allow control of network traffic to and from instances. For example, port 22 can be opened for SSH for a single IP or a range of IPs. Let's see how to create a security group for SSH access. Later we'll apply the security group we create to an instance. So I'm going to go to uh, Project and Network and then Security Groups. So you should see this single security group called Default. This security group restricts all incoming or ingress network traffic and allows all outgoing or egress network traffic. When an instance is created, the security when an instance is created, this security group is applied by default. So to allow the network traffic your instance requires, only open ports as required to just the needed IP ranges. To create a security group for SSH, we will cr click the Create Security Group button. And I'm just going to name this SSH. And then for the description, you can add something or you can just leave it blank. And then I'll click Create Security Group. And if you make a mistake, like you accidentally put a lowercase s instead of an uppercase s, we can go back to Security Group. And then I can go to Edit Security Group. And then we can just edit the name just like that and then click edit security group. Now I'm just going to um, click manage rules here and we'll go to that page we were at before. Uh, so after creating the SSH security group, we need to add a rule allowing SSH traffic. We'll allow SSH traffic from the first hardware node on the cloud to this instance. So I am going to click add rule. We'll need to obtain the IP address of the first hardware node of the cloud because we only want to SSH into it from that hardware node. So let's go back over to our open metal page. I'm going to go to assets and then I'm just going to copy the IP address of this first hardware node. Now we can fill in this information. So for rule, we will go to SSH and then for description, I'm going to put allows SSH from and then just that IP address that we just copied here and it looks like I copied some spaces so I'm just going to copy it again without spaces and for remote we'll leave CIDR and then I will just paste in the IP address here and then I'll just add this rule okay so now we can we can SSH into this network from from this specific IP address. We now have almost everything in place to create an instance. We'll need an SSH public key. An SSH, an SSH public key is required to access an instance over SSH. The key is injected into the instance when created. Uh, we actually are, have already done this in this course because we needed an SSH public key uh, in order to basically get this whole thing started. That's how we were able to SSH into our node earlier. Like I said, the key is injected into the instance when it's created. So 
what we're doing is we're creating an instance that can be accessed over SSH from one of the cloud's hardware nodes. So we'll have to create an SSH key pair in one of the hardware nodes. The public portion of that key pair is associated with the instance we'll create soon. Okay, I'm back at the terminal. I'm still logged into the hardware node where I got the password, the admin password we used previously. So if you're not logged into the hardware node, you should log in again, just like we did before. And now we're gonna create an SSH key pair. And I'm just gonna use the SSH key gen. And this time I am going to make a pair of size 4096 bits. So I'm gonna do the dash B and then the number of bits, 4096. And then I'm going to just press enter. And I'll just use these default values. If you've already created it before like I have, you can just overwrite it, but you probably won't have to because it will probably be the first time. And I'll create a passphrase. Okay, now I just have to get access to the public key that we just created. So I'll do cat root. Dot, so here's the directory that it got stored in, and the file name is id underscore rsa dot pub. Okay, so this is the public key. I'm just going to select all of this and copy it. Now, now that we have the SSH key for the instance, we're going to create the instance that can be accessed over SSH from the cloud's hardware node. So to do that, I am going to go to projects, then compute, then instances, and then launch instance. So there's a bunch of tabs here. We're not gonna go through all of them, but we're gonna go through a lot of them. Uh, some of them will just keep the default values. So I'm gonna cr create an instance name. For this example, I'm just gonna use jump station. You can call it anything you like and then you can optionally put a description. I'm just going to keep the rest of these to their default settings, and then I'm going to go to source. Now I'm going to make sure it's an image, uh, th that we're booting from an image, and uh, I'm just going to keep all these default. We are going to create a new volume. Now we have to choose which uh, which image that we're going to use. So for this example, we're not even going to use the image, we're not going to use the image that we uploaded. We're going to use CentOS 8. So we'll use the CentOS stream, and I'm just going to click this up arrow, and it's going to bring it right up into this allocated section. So this is showing that we are going to be using the CentOS 8 for the image on this instance. Now I'm going to go to the next tab, Flavor, and this is all about defining vCPUs, RAM, and disk space used by an instance. So there's a bunch of pre-built flavors, and the one we're going to use is just called M1 Small. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit, M1 Small, and then click the up arrow here, and it's going to have a set amount of RAM, disk space, root disks, and... Um, Next, uh, yeah, so this is what we're going to use for the flavor. Now we're going to go to networks. Now I'm going to bring up the the private network, the one that we created. Uh, these provide the communication channels for instance for instances in the cloud. And you can choose to add the external network as, as well, but it's not really recommended. It's better to use floating I, uh, floating IP if your instance is going to require internet connectivity. You should only expose portions of your network as necessary. This reduces the attack surface and improves the application security. If a private network is not created and an instance is created in a default cloud, it's associated with the external network. This means that the instance consumes a public IP and it could be reached over the internet. So next, we're, we're going to skip over network ports and go straight to security groups. And we're going to bring up the security group that we previously created, the SSH one. And then we are going to move to key pair. You can upload your key at this stage using the form, using the import key pair here. Uh, you can also create a key pair on this tab. 
uh, we already created the pair earlier from the first hardware node in the cloud. So we are going to just use the, the key that we already created. So we're going to click import key pair. And then I'm going to just name this um, jump station key. And the key type is going to be SSH key. And then you can either choose the file of the key or I can just paste it in here. Remember we copied it from our terminal. And then I'll just click import key pair. Once the public key is imported, we'll create the instance by pressing launch instance. Uh, the other tabs are just outside the scope of this demonstration here. So the instance is going to go through a build process. So you may have to allow a few min minutes for this to occur. And when complete, the instance will appear in the instance listings page. Well, I guess it's already appearing here. It's just not, it's still spawning, as it says here. And now it's complete. It's done. The instance has been created. Now we are going to assign and attach floating IPs basically a, an IP that people can access to get to this instance. The only way to connect to the instance is by exposing it via the floating IP or another instance in the same network. I'm just about to show you how to allocate a floating IP and attach it to this instance. So we're going to start by going to project here and then we're going to go to the network tab and then floating IPs and then allocate IP to project. We'll make sure the pool is set to external and then we can add a description if we want. It's even it's optional, you don't even have to. And then click allocate IP. Now we want to allocate the IP to the jump station instance by clicking this associate button here. So we have the IP address already filled in here, and we'll select a port. And the port will click the port that we called Jump Station. And then click Associate. So this instance is now available over SSH from the first hardware node in the cloud. So let's try logging in to the instance. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to copy this IP address. And then I'm going to go back over to the terminal. We're already logged into the hardware node. If you're not anymore, you can re-log into the hardware node over SSH. And then we are going to SSH into the instance we just created. So I'll do SSH-I. And now I'm going to put in the path to the private key that we created. And this uh, private key is basically like the password to log into this instance. So it's root slash dot SSH slash ID underscore RSA. And then I'm going to put in the IP address. Oh, but first, actually, I need, before the IP address that we copied earlier, I have to put in the username, which is going to be sent OS because that's just the default username of the operating system we installed on this instance. Okay, now I'm going to press enter here. And then it's going to see if I ask if I want to continue connecting. Yes. And now I can enter the passphrase that we created, that I created when I developed the, the private key pair, the public private key pair. So put in the passphrase and logged in. Great. In the next section, we'll do something while logged into the machine. But for now, let's go back over to the OpenStack web interface. So far, we've been learning how to manage OpenStack through a web browser. That's this one right here. Uh, but it's also possible to manage through the command line using OpenStack's CLI called OpenStack Client. Using the command line to manage your cloud introduces more flexibility in automation tasks and can generally make an administrator's life simpler. So let's learn how to get that installed. We'll install the OpenStack client CLI on the instance we just created that we named JumpStation. 
before installing OpenStack CLI, you must obtain two files from Horizon, which are required to prepare your shell environment. So let me show you how to get those files and talk more about them. I'm going to click where it says API access right here. And if I click down here, uh, it's going to show two different files that we can download. And we need to download both of them, the OpenStack, the clouds.yaml file and the RC file. Clouds.yaml is used as a source of configuration for how to connect to a cloud. And then the OpenStack RC file is used as a source of authentication for the user and project. And so I've now downloaded both of those files. And now we need to prepare and install OpenStack client. So I'm going to go back over to the terminal. And I'm still logged in to the instance, the instance we created previously. So let's go through the steps to prepare and install the OpenStack client. So first we need to prepare the clouds.yaml. So first we need to get the files that we downloaded pre just now onto our local machine. We need to transfer them to this instance. So let me show you how to do that. First, we're going to get the clouds.yaml file over to this instance. I'm going to start by making a directory on our instance. So make directory. And I'm going to call this, it's, the directory is going to be slash dot config slash open stack. Now that I've created the directory, so I'm going to create and open a blank clouds.yaml file. I'm going to use the v editor. So if I use the v command and I put in a file name, it will open a file to start editing. And if the file doesn't already exist, it will create that file. So I'm going to navigate to the directory that we just created. And then I'm going to call this clouds.yaml. Okay, now we have to get the contents from the cloud.yaml file on our local computer into this instance. So basically, we're going to open up clouds.yaml in a text editor on our local computer. Okay, so I got clouds.yaml open. I'm just going to copy this. This is just in Sublime Text on my local computer. You can open up, up in any text editor. Now I'm going to go back to the, the V or Vi text editor on the instance, and I'm just going to paste in the contents of the file. Now to save it, I'm going to hit the escape key, then I'm going to hit the colon key, and then WQ, W for write or save, and Q for quit. Okay, so I just saved the, the clouds.yaml file onto here. And now we are going to do the same thing with the OpenStack RC file. Oh, and by the way, the clouds.yaml file can actually be saved in a, a few different locations, but the one we saved in is a is a common place to save the file. So the um, the OpenStack RC file it doesn't really matter where you save the file. So I'm just going to save it um, basically right where we're at right now. So I'm going to do v, and then I'm just going to call the make I'm going to create and start editing a file called development dash open rc dot sh this is going to be a shell file that we can run it'll help allow us to run commands now I'm going to open that file on the local machine okay so I'm just going to cop or select all the file copy and go back to the instance here and just just paste in the contents of the file. And again, I'm going to press escape, then colon, then WQ, and that's going to save and exit the file. Now we'll source the development OpenRC file, which will allow us to run OpenStack commands. And I'll have to put in my OpenStack password. Now we are going to create a Python virtual environment. We're going to create the virtual environment so we don't interfere with the system's Python version. In the default Cent OS 8 stream installation, the system's, the system's Python execu executable is called Platform Python. So we're going to use that to create the virtual environment. So let me show you. First, we have to access, we have to put in the directory where the 
the Python version is on this um, instance, which is that at this um, at this spot on the computer, lib exec slash platform dash Python, and then we have to v e and v is how we're going to create the virtual environment, and we're going to create the virtual environment at this directory at this path slash v e and v. Okay, uh, we created that, and now I just need to activate the Python virtual environment. So I'm going to do source, and then v e and v slash bin slash activate. Okay, we know we're activated because we have this. This is the name of the virtual, what we call, we, this is the name of the virtual environment right here. Next, we need to upgrade pip. Um, pip is used to install um, different Python packages on the instance. So I'm going to upgrade pip with the command pip up, pip install upgrade pip. Okay, now we need to install OpenStack Client, which is what we've been working toward this whole time. So there's two OpenStack packages, but the one that um, is kind of maintained more is called Python-OpenStackClient. So we're going to do pip install Python-OpenStackClient. Okay, we now have the OpenStack CLI installed on our instance. So there's quite a few things you can do with this CLI. We're not really going to cover all of them or very much, but I'm going to just show you a few things. Like, um, one th like uh, for an initial command, we can list the servers associated with the project. So I can do OpenStack. That's how we start the OpenStack CLI. And I'm going to put server list. Okay, and actually, I'm going to use this zoom out so this looks better. Let's zoom out quite a bit for this to. Okay, there we go. So we can see we just have one server. This is the one we created, Jump Station. We call it Jump Station. Remember, we chose an M1.small for the flavor. And so this is basically the server that we previously created. I'm just going to zoom in again here, and when using the OpenStack client, there's typically a common command pattern for what you want to accomplish. All OpenStack commands begin with OpenStack. You can execute OpenStack by itself to enter into a shell where commands no longer need to be pre prefixed by OpenStack. So I can just type in OpenStack, and now we can type in any command. So we can do the server list. And it's going to basically show this the same thing from before. I'm not going to zoom out again, just so you can see what I'm typing in a little more. Uh, but let's go out of this. And now I'm just going to run OpenStack from the command line again. And if you use OpenStack help, then we can list all available subcommands. Initially, see all the flags that you can pass. But after scrolling a bit, uh, you'll see the, com the command list will start here. So these are all the, the commands that we can, we can use. And I'll just quit out of that before we see all of them, because there's quite a few. Uh, if you see, after you see the available commands, you can learn more about a command just using uh, OpenStack help. This is like a lot of uh, CLIs. We can just do OpenStack help. And let's say we want to know about the server command. Open it. So if we do that, then it's going to show the different commands we can use uh, with OpenStack server. So these are all the things that we can do with a server. It's very common when using OpenStack client to list items and the command form it is typically the OpenStack subcommand list. So um, for instance, we can do open OpenStack server list. 
and so that's going to list the servers just like we had shown before. You can also get more information about an item by using the show command. So uh, let me give you an example. We can do open stack server show jump station. So there's the name of the server. And here we're going to show details about the server. So there's quite a bit more you can do with the OpenStack open CLI. Administrators generally use the CLI if they need complex options as they may not be available through the graphic user interface. But that's basically all we're going to talk about in this course. Um, if you're interested in any particular thing, you can just look up the documentation to figure out how to do what you want to do in the CLI. So now we're going to talk about how private clouds are deployed. We're going to learn more about how your private cloud is deployed and learn more about the environment. OpenStack can be deployed in several different ways, and this section highlights the characteristics of this private cloud. We're going to explain some of the advantages of this type of deployment and some things that are unique to OpenMetal. Let's talk more about the containerization of OpenStack. Like I mentioned, OpenMetal uses Cola Ansible, and it uses it to set up Docker containers for running services. So if you need to make any configuration changes to your nodes, Cola Ansible should be used to push those changes. If it's not used, then there's a risk of the changes being reverted during the system updates. Some advantages of containerization through Docker are that the containers create an isolated environment, reducing software dependencies. Containers can be scaled and allow for services to balance across your cluster. Containers provide increased flexibility for test releases, patches, and automation. And containers have a consistent and repeatable deployment and a shorter initialization time. In OpenMetal, disk storage is provided through Ceph. Ceph is an object storage interface that can pr provide interfaces for multiple different storage types on a single cluster. In OpenMetal, Ceph is comprised of two elements, object storage and block storage. The Ceph object storage utilizes the Ceph object storage gateway daemon. With OpenMetal clouds, Ceph's RGW replaces Swift, so there is no Docker container for Swift. Instead, Swift endpoints are connected directly to the RGW. Authentication for RGW is handled through Keystone. Uh, Ceph block storage connects to the sender service utilizing Ceph's RADOS block device. Within the cloud, these objects are stored in Ceph pools. Ceph provides a layer of abstraction that allows objects to be recognized as blocks. Some advantages of using Ceph are data is self-healing and will, will redistribute data across your cluster in the event of power, hardware, or connectivity issues. Also, data is replicated and highly available. And Ceph has the ability to run on common commodity hardware and to mix hardware from different vendors. Ceph was selected as the storage solution for private cloud core OpenStack clouds due to its ability to store data in a replicated fashion. The data stored in the Ceph cluster is accessible from any of your cloud's control plane nodes. The storage is considered shared across all nodes, which can make recovering an instance and its data trivial. So let's learn how to check the status of your Ceph cluster and see available disk usage using the command line. So first, let's make sure we're logged into the cloud's, one of the cloud's control plane nodes, not an instance. So if you were logged into the instance before, you're going to have to log out one layer to the control plane node, but not log out so far that you're on your local computer. So to check the status of the Ceph cluster, we can use Ceph status. So I'll do, just do Ceph status, and then we can get a lot of information about... Um, how like like we can get the usage information, number of objects, the number of pools, and stuff like that. And to check the available disk space in your Ceph cluster, we can use Ceph DF, and we can see that how how much we have available, how much has been used, and a lot of information about the various pools. Now let's look at how to find the resource usage of the private cloud. We'll explore how to utilize the Horizon dashboard to determine the total memory and compute usage for a project, as well as how to view instances stored on each node. 
Then we'll look at disk usage by explaining how to briefly interact with the cloud's Ceph cluster using the command line. And finally, we'll go over adding and removing nodes from the Ceph cluster. There are currently three variations to private cloud deployments, small, standard, and large. All private cloud deployments have a cluster of three hyperconverged servers, but will have different allocations of memory, storage, and CPU processing power depending on the configuration and hardware. In addition, you have the option of adding additional hardware nodes to the cluster. So let's view the resources used by the cloud. We have to be logged in as the admin user. So I'm going to sign out and then I'm gonna log in as admin. If you remember to get the password, we actually have to log in with our command with the command line. So let's go over to the command line and we're already logged in. So I am going to use this line right here, grep keystone admin password and then the um, path and then we can get the admin password. You can always change this if you want to make it uh, something that's uh, different than that. But I'll sign in here. So once we're in the admin project, I'm going to navigate to admin, compute, hypervisors. And this is going to show a few items, the vCPU usage, the memory usage, and the local disk usage. There's also an option to see the location of your instances within your cluster. To view this information, we'll go to the admin compute instances here, and then you have the option to see the, the project, the host, as well as IP addresses and the status, and, a, and just a bunch of other, or, and the power state, and just a bunch of other things here. To access information regarding your Ceph cluster's resource pools, you'll need to use Ceph's CLI. So let's go back over to the terminal, and uh, let me, let's just do some common uh, useful resource monitoring and health commands. So to check the status of Ceph, we'll just do Ceph-S, and so this is just a shortened version of one of the commands we used earlier. And then you can do Ceph DF. And uh, again, this is one that we've already covered, but some of the new ones would be Ceph Health Detail. Health, okay. And another one is Ceph o OSD Pool LS. So list this pools, and we can add the detail, like we can put images for additional this will give us additional details regarding replication and health metrics we've reached the end of this course you now know the basics of OpenStack now there's a lot more you can do with OpenStack but you should know enough now to start learning more on your own well thanks for watching